Welcome, my name is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and we thank you for taking some time to listen to some audio recordings from the pulpit of the Riverview Baptist Church. Our desire is to show the Lord high, holy, and lift it up, as well as try to be a blessing to those through the Word of God. Please enjoy this message, and we pray that it will be a blessing to your life. And if you wouldn't mind to take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me to the Old Testament book of Proverbs. The Old Testament book of Proverbs and Proverbs in chapter number 30. The book of Proverbs and chapter number 30. We're continuing with our series that we're hitting on Sunday nights dealing with the history of the Bible. How did we get our English Bible? And as we have been starting, we started off by describing the preservation of Scripture and that God's promise to preserve his word. Built upon that promise, we begin to talk about terms and begin to give definitions. What's an unseal? What's a lexicon? Um, a lectionary. We started to describe some of those things. Now as we start moving on in history, we came to a period of time that is called the silent years. And we spoke about that last week. And we're going to continue with that thought in just a moment to give evidence that we do have evidence that God preserved his scriptures and that the scriptures are exactly what God had given to us and intended us to have. But before we go into there, we want to start with a Bible principle and we find our way to the book of Proverbs chapter number 30. The book of Proverbs chapter number 30 and notice with me in verse number 5. Proverbs chapter 30 and verse number 5, it says, every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add not, add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee and thou be found a liar. And if you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, would you mark a phrase that we find in the book of Proverbs chapter number 30? Proverbs chapter 30, and notice with me in verse number 6, where we see a declarative statement, Add thou not unto his words. Add thou not unto his words. And with this, we're going to examine a little bit more of how we got our English Bible and giving more evidence. But we want to start off with a premise here of adding not unto his words. Let's go to the Lord. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again for you being a wonderful God. And thank you that you are a God that's real, that's not imaginary, that, that's not something we made up. But as you, even as we're talking to you, we're talking to a real being. And as I come up to you, I'm asking that you would help me just to settle down inside of you, to be able to trust, depend upon you, not on myself, not on my intellect, not on my study. I'm trusting that you would get this accomplished, that you would make it clear, that you would let it be easy to under, be understood. Fill me with your spirit and you guide and direct and you get your own work accomplished here tonight. And we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, as I said, I want to start off with a principle here about not adding to God's word. Now, God gives three specific warnings in the beginning of the Bible, in the middle of the Bible, and at the end of the Bible, all talking about not adding or taking away to God's word. This is the middle part where God says in the book of Proverbs that we're not to add to God's word. Notice if you don't mind, as we see this passage, we see in verse number five that every word of God is pure. And again, this is speaking about God's inspiration, that God has given us his word pure and that it is without corruption. It is God's word. It's not mixed in with our words. Now, if somebody adds to God's word, according to this passage, it says, add not unto his word, lest he be reprove thee and thou be found a liar. Here God says that if anyone adds to God's word, they're going to be found a liar. If God didn't say it, then we can't depend on it and trust on it. It will be exposed. And so God's giving a specific warning. If you add to my word, you are going to be found to be a liar. Now, you can't believe the Bible and come to a position that the Bible contains the Word of God at the same time believing that it has been intermingled with the words of man. By the way, most people seem to have this idea that man corrupted the Bible. But the Bible's still the Bible. Well, it can't be both. 
The Bible says it is pure words. It is what God has given us to do. It can't contain God's word and man's word mixed in. It's got to be God's word or it is not. You can't believe the Bible and still believe that it's been messed with. The Bible does not contain the word of God. It is the word of of God. The very word that God wanted us to have. Now let's look at the end warning in the book of Revelation 22. Towards the very end of the Bible. The Revelation is the last book of the Bible. Revelation 22 is very close to the last chapter in the Bible. Or it is the last chapter. Revelation 22. And notice with me as we look at this, starting at verse number 18, Revelation chapter 22, and notice with me in verse number 18, and once again, I want you to see for yourself God's warning on this. Revelation chapter 18, or 22, verse number 18, for I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add to these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of this book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written from in this book. Verse number 20 he which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Now, with this, we see the very clear warning. Don't add anything or take away from the Bible. That is God's stern warning. Don't mess with his words. Now, in this passage, just so we can be clear, who is testifying in verse number 18? Notice, it says, For I testify to every man. Verse uh, 20, we see, He which testifieth these things, saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Who is testifying? Who is saying this? Jesus is saying these things. It's the same one that is coming for us in verse 20 is the one that's testifying and say don't add or take away from God's word. It's his testimony. It is his words. Now in the Bible, this is a principle. I want you to get a hold of this. This is a serious thing. In the Bible, you will find liars and murderers, thieves and sinners of all sort. And you're going to see those liars and thieves went to heaven. But let me think, think about David. Did David lie? Did he murder? Did he commit adultery? Is he in heaven? Yes. You have Saul who was a murderer. Is he in heaven? You have Jacob who was a liar. Is he in heaven? Yes. So you have liars and you have murderers and you have thieves. They, they're mentioned in the Bible and yet it gives a declaration they're in heaven. Hold on to this thought. You will not find someone who rejected the Bible who went to heaven. Think about that. Why is that? Why is it that you don't find anyone who said, I don't believe the Bible's true, and you don't find them in heaven? Well, it is only through the Bible that we know about salvation. And so if they reject the Bible, they also reject of any way of knowing about salvation. Let me prove it to you. Gospel record of John chapter 5 and verse 38. Search the scriptures for in them ye think that you have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me. Now you understand this warning of not changing God's word is a big, big deal. Because if anyone gets to the place where they don't believe in God's word, they're also at the place where they cannot believe the promises God gives about salvation and forgiveness. This is a big deal. If someone's a liar, they could repent and come back to God's word. If somebody is a murderer, they could repent and they could come to God's word. But if they reject God's word, what can they turn back to? They're stuck. So you understand this is a big deal. Some people say, why am I wasting my time? Because of this. Because what the world and Satan, the spiritual warfare is trying to do is trying to cause people to doubt God's word. And when they take away God's word, they get rid of all the help that they could possibly have. It's taken away from them. 
What a horrible position to come to. When someone rejects the Bible, there's nothing that could lead them to repentance. Now with that, let's go back to our subject that we had started last week, speaking about the silent centuries. If you don't mind, let's kind of recap what this idea is. John the Apostle finishes his writing in about 90 AD. The first complete New Testament manuscripts are dated about 400 AD. And so there's a little gap between John's writing and the complete manuscripts that we find in 400 AD. This in between this completion of the text to the dating of the oldest manuscript is a time period that the scholars call the silent years. Now the scholars claim that this period of silence makes it impossible to authenticate the, what the disciples and the apostles truly wrote. So they said we can't know what John really said. All we have is the idea of what people told us. It's like the telephone game. And that's not trustworthy. The theologians write papers on the silent years all to reject the authority and the authenticity of God's word. However, the literature found in these silent years, which we talked about last week, does more to support the Bible than it does to support the professor's arguments. And what we spent last time is just the idea of who's writing and what are they writing about and what are they speaking about in the Bible that they had. Now, according to those who support the idea of the silent years, the apostles passed on the things they remembered about the Lord verbally. The disciples would in turn pass on those stories to others over time and these oral traditions began to be developed following the death of the apostles. These oral traditions were eventually collected and written down and became the basis of the New Testament text. This is what the scholars would say. So they would say that all our New Testament text is actually based off of oral tradition and we did our best to gather them together, but we can't really know for sure. So this teaches that the words are not as important. As long as you have the general message, it doesn't matter what words you use. Well, that's a problem. As an application to this teaching, it says it doesn't matter what version you use. As long as the general message is conveyed, that is good enough. Now, those who support the silent centuries teaching says there's no way of knowing what the Bible says for sure. And what this does is it takes away from God's word, causes people to doubt God's word, causes people to reject God's word, and thus missing out on the promises that God has given to them through his word. Now to counter this, the teaching of the silent centuries, we have the witness of history during this time period. Now like I said last time, we took time to talk about the writings. What other evidence do we have? Is this just a straw man that has this one uh, thing and you pull the one straw and our argument falls apart? Is there any other evidence that we have? Well, not only do we have the writings of others, personal letters that they would send to each other, there was also something we have called apologetics. Apologetics. Now, apologetics isn't where you apologize for being a Christian. In fact, apologetics is a branch of study that's on the defense of faith. Apologetics is a branch of study on the defense of the faith. Now, in the ancient world, this study had already begun to be formed. That people had found that in order to keep the salvation that we have, Jude speaks of this, that I also have to earnestly contend for the faith. I have to defend what I believe and why I believe it. So let's talk about a couple of these uh, people who were apologetics. Um, <coughs> We come to this man, Artisticides. I had the name practiced before, Artisticides. Ah, forget it. So, he was a Greek philosopher who was converted to Jesus Christ under the preaching of Justin Martyr. Eusebius said he was the friend of man who would be the companions of Jesus. What do you mean by that? Well, he continued to wear his philosopher's robe. Now remember, before he got saved, he had earned these philosopher robes. And so whenever someone would wear these philosopher robes and they would go into a town square, he would be considered a man of learning. And people would line up because they wanted to hear what this man, this philosopher, would have to say. And so what he would do after he came to know Christ is he would still wear these earned robes and and he would go out and people would come and say, oh man, I want to hear what he has to say. And he would use this as a platform to preach the word of God. His testimony brings in with us the personal touch with the first century 
uh, church, meaning that he actually knew the people of the first century. He knew the apostles personally. He knew, he talked to Paul, he talked to Peter, he talked to John. He knew these people personally. In 117 AD, he wrote a book called In Defense of the Christian Faith to the Roman Emperor at that time, Hadrian. He began his appeal to Emperor Hadrian Hadrian, by referring to the noble lives of the Christians, the deeds of charity those Christians habitually practiced, and the chaste lives that they admittedly lived. He pleaded to the Roman emperor for protection for such a gentle and worthy citizens from oppression and persecution. He appealed to the New Testament scriptures and summed up the chief doctrine of Christianity in these words. So this is what this is right. he's writing to the Roman emperor. Now the Christians reckon their race from the Lord Jesus Christ. And he is by them confessed to be the Son of God Most High. Having by the Holy Ghost come down from heaven and having been born of the Hebrew virgin and <clears throat> having completed his wonderful dispensation, he was pierced by the Jews after three days, revived, and went up to heaven of the glory of his coming again on that canst read, O king, and that which is called by them the evangelistic scriptures of the New Testament. Now here's a guy writing in 117 AD, writing to the Roman emperor and says, hey, you could also read this for yourself in the scriptures. How can you read about Jesus in the scriptures if you don't have scriptures to read? Doesn't that make sense? Then we come to Justin Martyr. So Justin Martyr we have brought up before with his writings, but he was also someone who was important in the idea of apologetics. He was martyred in 166 AD. He was a man of learning himself, and he was traveled as an itinerant preacher. That means that he didn't stay in one place, but he would travel around preaching from church to church to church as he traveled. He... He addressed his first apology. Now remember, the word apology doesn't mean he's apologizing for being a Christian. But in fact, he's defending his faith as a Christian to a man by the name of Atonius in the year 138 AD. Christians had been charged with three specific errors. So during this time, he writes an apology, uh, a defense. But the Christians have been uh, charged with three things that he's trying to defend them on. These errors are atheism. Now, we know that Christians don't believe in atheism. But they're, they're charged. Well, they don't believe in the Roman gods. They've been accused of immorality in conduct. And they've been accused of being disloyal to the government. So Justin Martyr, with these charges, is now making a defense trying to say, let me tell you what Christians are really like. Having successfully refuted these charges, Justin put forth in a scholarly and dignified manner the true facts of Christianity, establishing the pure morality of the teachings of Christ as contrasted to the vices of the heathen practice. He then proceeded to show that the noble doctrines of Christianity are based on the revelation of God made in the Old Testament, specifically referring to Isaiah's prophecy of the virgin's birth, meaning that the reason why our main tenet of faith inside of Christianity is that Jesus was born of a virgin. We had spoke a little bit about this last time. Twice this has been made in apologetics that Jesus was born of a virgin to prove that he was 100% God as well as 100% man. Now in a clear paragraph and touching to the worship of believers in Jesus, Justin states that they met, these Christians met every Sunday to praise God and worship by the reading of the Old Testament Testament and the memoirs of the apostles and the disciples. What are the memoirs of the apostles and the disciples called the New Testament letters? That they read the New Testament. Now he's talking about this in 100s AD that the Christians gather together and they're reading New Testament scripture together in church. Well, again, what are they reading if there's no such thing as New Testament Christian or uh, 
scriptures. Then after prayers and thanksgiving, an address was delivered by the president, the preacher, the person in charge, after which they had communion and quietly dispersed to their houses. Now, doesn't that sound similar to a church service today that we gather together, read the scripture, uh, read what the Bible has to say. We give prayers, we give thanksgiving, uh, we listen to preaching, and then we um, observe any of the ordinances that we observe that day and go home. Sounds pretty simple to get. We're just following the same pattern. Now, not only do we have the idea of apologetics, but we also have ancient books. Ancient books that prove that we had scriptures. Now, last week we only hit one main subject and went through it. We're going to hit about seven today. And I'm just again showing there's plenty of evidence that we had scriptures at this time. All right. Now we come to what is called a Greek cafeteria. That's not what it means. The diatessaron. The diatessaron. The diatessaron was written by a man by the name of Tatian. He was a philosopher who was a convert of Justin Martyr. We just talked about Justin Martyr just a second ago. This is one of his converts. He was born in 110 AD and died a martyr in 166. He tried to find truth and philosophy, but he could not. So before he came to know the Lord, he tried to find answers. And so he searched philosophy. He looked in the Greek writings. He tried to find something, but he could not find the answers of life and what life is about in philosophy. May I tell you that you still cannot find the answers in life and secular learning. You will not find what is true. Now, he then became a believer in the Old Testament scriptures. Let's see what he has to say about this. He says, while I was giving my most earnest attention to this matter, I happened to meet with a certain barbaric writings. Now remember, in the ancient world, it was either Greek or barbarian. If something was in Greek, it was noble. If it was in any other language, it was considered barbaric. Okay, so it's not talking about caveman or something like this. He says, as I was doing studies, I happened to run into a, uh, some writings that was in a different language. And I ran into these barbaric writings, too old to be compared with the opinions of the Greeks, and too divine to be compared with their errors. I was led to put faith in these by an unpretending cast of the language, the inartificial character of the writers, and the foreknowledge displayed the future events, the excellent quality of the precepts, and the declaration of the government of the universe is centered on one being. So he said, as I did my scriptures, I found this book. And as I started to read this book written in, in this ancient barbaric language, I read it and I go, this is great. This is wonderful. The Greeks don't have this knowledge. Other people don't have this knowledge. It doesn't have the Greeks' mistakes. Man, it had to be written by God. And as he studied it, he said, I started to read it and see the language of it. Started to see how it was written. Looked at the character of the writers. I saw the display of future events, prophecies, and saw as they were fulfilled, just as they were declared. And I had to say, the one who wrote this book, this is God. I, I want to follow this God. And so he became a, became a believer of the Old Testament scriptures. Well, that's a good start. So in summary, he said, I studied philosophy and then read the Bible. When I read the Bible, it was far superior to anything else that I looked at, so I just had to believe it. Having then accepted that God revealed the Old Testament by the reason of prophecies contained therein and the fulfillment of these prophecies, Titation began to preach about the God of Israel. So he says, I want to tell people what I learned. This God of Israel, he's the real God. Well, then he met Justin Martyr. And the Justin Martyr said, guess what? You only know half the, the equation. Let me tell you the other half. And he led him to the Lord Jesus Christ. And said, let me tell you more about what you need to know. Tatian ate this up and came to know Jesus Christ as his personal savior. Then Tatian continued to teach in the highest circles, which his status as a philosopher gave him access before he was martyred in 160 AD. So again, he said he'd have those philosopher robes go out and preach a message. People would flock because he looked smart and they figured that he knew what he was talking about. Now, before his death, Tatian tried a bold achievement. Now, again, this is a scholar. This is someone who likes study, who likes to research things. So let's see what he tried to put together. 
Before this time, none of the New Testament books have ever been gathered into a formal canon. That one church would have one book and the other church would have another book. Uh, And so he said, let's gather them together. These separate manuscripts were widely scattered and in the possession of several apostolic churches. His work was to help gather copies of the different New Testaments together so people could have it. Tatian desired a compact copy of the four Gospels, so for his own use, he compiled the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and he put them in parallel columns on a wide parchment. So over here, you would have Matthew, and then you would have Mark, and then you would have Luke, and you'd have John, and then you would turn the page, and they would have all four of them lined up. Now, he did this on his own because he wanted to have all four Gospel records together. That's pretty smart. Now, by the way, how can you do that if they don't exist? He had to have something if he's going to write it down. This this four-column gospel record uh, putting them together is called the Ditesseron. That's pretty amazing. This work was finished in 150 AD. This four-column putting together of the four gospel records. Now it was lost for some time, but when it was recovered, it was recovered in two languages, meaning that the Old Testament people, they used it for a while. It was lost to us in history, but then we found it and found proof. Hey, look, it did exist. It wasn't of our imagination. We found it. It was uh, actually translated into two different languages. It became very popular in the Eastern church from the time of its appearance And the Arabian and Syrian saints copied it extensively. Again, you have all four gospel records. We want to use it. Let's make copies of it and spread it around and use it. Then we come to another one, the Didachi. Didachi. This is another book that was put at this time. The official title of the Didachi is The Lord's Teaching Through the Twelve Apostles to the Gentiles. Big title. That's why people would just... Uh, bring it down and call it the Didache, the uh, Lord's teaching through the 12 apostles to the Gentiles. This is a record that has been known to the scholars since 1885, meaning that we have archaeological evidence and that the scholars have known about this since 1885. This famous document is often quoted by the first, second, and third century states, uh, saints. They quoted it quite extensively. They would say, just like it said in the Didache, and they would make record of it. So not only do we have copies of it today that's been known to scholars since 1885, that we have the uh, first, second, and third century writers that would make reference to this book. It was compiled by an unknown author or authors about 80 AD. Now that's pretty important if we're putting dates together. 80 AD. Somebody knew that the 12 apostles taught, they knew what they taught about Jesus Christ and were collecting a record of what they taught in 80 AD. So what did Peter teach? What did Paul teach? We could put it together in a book. Now The Christians in 80 AD also understood that not only Paul, but all of the apostles were sent to carry the good news to the Gentiles. They knew that. That was the title of the book. The message of the 12 apostles to the Gentiles. This booklet was known as the Didache, was written in New Testament Greek, meaning the same Greek that the New Testament was written in, and it contains dissertations on the worship and service of the church, meaning that it gives instructions about things that should operate in the church. For example, the book deals with water baptism, all right? Who is the right candidate? How do we baptize? Why do we baptize? What's the purpose of it? We have the instructions on communion. What are we supposed to do? Do at the Lord's Supper. What is the instructions? How do we operate that? The walk of the believer in the world. So how does a Christian operate in the world. And then the general summary of the teachings unique to Christianity. Do you know that there are some things that we believe that Buddhism doesn't believe? There are some things that we believe that the Roman gods and those who follow them didn't believe. And so this book would give a summary so someone could read it. Hey, what's the difference between Christianity and what I believe? Here's a book. Read it for yourself. I like books. You should be able to learn how to read and learn information. Good. Now, the Didache is one of the first, if not the earliest, of the Christian writings and is the oldest except for the New Testament itself, one of the oldest writings. And it tells all about these things. 
Nothing has come to us of this nature any older than that of the Didache. Now, John the Apostle himself may have written from the pages. Remember, John dies at 90 AD. The Didache was written at 80 AD. So John the Apostle probably read from its pages. And some believe that he actually contributed to its contents that he helped uh, put together the Didache. The entire early church was familiar with it and it is quoted over and over and over again inside of the ancient writings. Barnabas, Comlent, Eusebius, Anthenius, all of these men cited and every authority and leader of the Eastern church made use of it and quoted it and made reference to it. Now it's evident that the compilers were familiar with the New Testament in the same text as we have today. Now the Didache was written in 80 AD before John died. There are 25 direct quotations from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Direct quotes. Now, there are no references to the gospel record of John because John hasn't written it yet. That would make sense if it's written before John wrote the book. There's going to be no quotes from John. But John had access to it. In addition to the three gospels that are quoted, there are references to 14 other New Testament books that were added to later editions to the Didache. Now, once again, we have a book that proves we had scriptures and they had scriptures even back in that time. This Didache, the later editions, included portions of Romans, Ephesians, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Philippians, Titus, Philemon, Acts, and Jude. All of those have portions of those books put in the Didache. Now, we had talked about different things. We had apologetics. We had different books that was written. We also have evidence of other versions. We had made mention of this a couple sessions earlier, but we're going to repeat it again. That very early on in the early days of the New Testament church, the Bible was translated into different languages of that day. The oldest translation was the Syriac Peshito. It was written about 150 AD. Now again, how can you translate something if you don't have something to translate from? Now, John had finished his writing at 90 AD, and so have a book translated into a different language is pretty close to the source at 150 AD. It is pretty close to when John had died. It was translated in Antioch, located in Syria. Now, if you don't mind, starting from right now, I want you to mentally note how many times we mention Antioch. We're going to mention it a whole session next week, speaking about the headquarters of the New Testament church. But Antioch, Syria is going to be one of the important places that we need to note when we talk about the history of the Bible. Now, if there's a translation of the Bible in Syrian, it implies that there's something to translate from. The Syriac translation in about 150 AD agrees in every essential detail within the text of the King James Bible that we have today. You said every essential detail. Well, we understand that there are some things that when you translate uh, changes a little bit. For example, we have the word toothbrush, right? Do you know to translate that in Spanish, it takes three words for that one word? That we have a different thing. There are different idioms and different cultural things that you have to take in place that we have to explain or try to, uh, you know, we use a lot of uh, colloquial terms, a lot of um, imagery terms, similes, and um, I just forgot the pictorial language. We use a lot of pictorial language. For someone who doesn't know what you're talking about and you give that little expression, they look at you and go like, what does that mean? Well, we understand that some of that you have to take care of in translation to explain what is being referred to. Now, another version was called the Coptic version. It was translated for the church of Egypt and the church of Syria. So for people in Egypt to be able to read it. It was translated again in 150 AD. So we have another translation. We also know that the Latin version was translated 157. We're not going to touch on that this time, but we're just saying that there are different languages that it's translated. A complete copy of the Coptic version was found in the ruins of the White Monastery, 150 miles north of Cairo, Egypt. And when they dug up this ancient version, it dated back to the ancient world. And they go, look, it's just like the Bible we have today. Just translate it into a type of Egyptian language, Coptic. 
There are vellum copies and papyrus codex copies that date to 265 AD. Now again, they had something to translate from. The critics will say that the oldest existing manuscripts that we have contain that we have that contain any substantial portion of the New Testament date from 325 AD. And we would agree, but they have it in the Greek language. And the other languages, we could see that there are other translations out there that are complete in different languages showing that they had a New Testament to translate from. Now let's go to a different subject. Let's go to archaeology. All right. Now, <laughs> I know we've gotten a lot of information. We're going to wake you up in just a second. I think you're going to enjoy some of this stuff. Let's first of all cover wax tablets. Now, as an illustration, I didn't get it here in time. It got shipped a little bit late. But this week, Wednesday, and next week, I'll have a wax tablet that you could see for yourself. These wax tablets are pretty cool. These are made out of a flat, thin board, approximately 7 by 9 inches, that are surrounded by a raised beading on this enclosed surface. And they pour wax inside of it. Uh, <laughs> and when the wax would harden, it would become a nice, flat, smooth surface. The Roman Empire had men that were comparable to our modern letter carriers, which covered stated routes over the countryside, and they would deliver wax tablets from one place to another. These men were called tabularii. They were distinguished by a broad leather belt girding their waist, and from this belt, tablets could be suspended by hooks. So they would have this um, sash over them, this leather sash, and then have a hook that would have all of these uh, uh, wax tablets. And what they would do is that if one man in one city desired to write um, to a man in another community, he would take his tablet, he would write his message, he would now address it and say, this needs to go to so-and-so in this city. He would wait for the tabularum who was assigned to go that away. Then when the tabularum would show up, he would give the man a tablet and small coin to pay for his service, and then he would receive back a blank tablet. So he would trade his written message and he would get back a blank tablet. This way, everyone always had the same amount as they would exchange it. You give one, you get one back. After being read by the recipient, so the letter carrier would bring it to the person, the recipient would take it. He would then turn the tablet back if he said, okay, I read the message, thanks. He would either give it back or he would hand him a blank one and keep the one that was written in by the carrier. Now, contracts were drawn, invoices were made, trade agreements were reduced to writing, and they were all done by these wax tablets. When the writing on the tablet was obsolete, the face of the tablet was smoothed over, and you can now use it again. Again, wax was made so it could be last forever, or you can melt it and wipe it clean and use it again. These tablets lasted indefinitely. The wax is hard enough to hold an impression for as long as necessary, but also soft enough that you could still reuse it. The expression of having a clean slate actually comes from the use of these wax tablets. Again, I'm going to bring one here, and maybe someone who wants to say, I want an inventive way to write my memory verses down. Why don't you do that? Take a wax tablet, have a stylus, and write down your memory verse on it. Then you have it. If you've got a new memory verse, you could erase it. Now, I don't want to get too far ahead of me, but that's a recommendation that perhaps you'd like to do if you want to do something creative more than just writing it on an index card. Now, hold on a second. One of the fascinating discoveries of archaeology also has to do with these tablets of wax. The first and second century Christians desiring to memorize scriptures would often write this, uh, those verses on tables of wax and they didn't erase them, but they kept them. And so, guess what? These ancient records have been exhumed with the verses in the New Testament text still legible on those wax tablets. And they have found tons of them. Now, though we wouldn't base a case of the existence of our Bible text, or we wouldn't make a translation based off these fagatory records, what we can do is say, hey, look, they had a Bible. And we could see what they had. When you collect hundreds of thousands of them and find their wording to match the manuscript records of the Bible, it should be noticed. Now, I gave you the thing, maybe those who are creative don't want to just be boring and write it on a piece of paper, 
Why don't you get a wax tablet? They're easy to make. They're easy to order. They're little things. Write down the memory verse. Ch- kind of chip it into the wax. Again, I'll bring one so you could see it. Then you could have it forever. This is what I wrote down. This is the memory verse that I have. Just for those who have created minds. For those who are boring, you could still use index cards. Whatever works. Well, let's also cover papyrus. Now, we covered papyrus before, but... We have papyrus evidence, but I want to teach you a Bible lesson based off papyrus. I told you I was going to keep you awake. Here's something for you. Turn with me, if you don't mind, to the book of Colossians, chapter number 2. The book of Colossians, chapter number 2, and I want you to see this expression that is given in the book of Colossians, chapter number 2. Colossians, chapter number 2, and notice with me, if you don't mind, in verse number 13. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 13. And you being dead in your trespasses or in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him having forgiven you all trespasses. Blotting out the handwriting of the ordinances which was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Now, this idea of blotting out that we find here in the book of Colossians chapter 2 and verse 14, we have this phrase blotting out. This blotting out is a reference to a custom that was very common in Paul's day. This phrase had to do exclusively with the records that were written on papyrus. This reed type paper, they would take reeds and they would flatten them out and squeeze them together and you would make a cheap form of paper. This papyrus is a reed paper that is pressed and dried then used as a writing material. Sometimes it was necessary to erase the writing and write something else in its place. This process was called blotting it out. The first writing was blotted out by wetting the face of the papyrus carefully with water and when it was moistened you would rub it gently until the surface started to peel away in little balls of paper and the writing would just be erased away that you would blot it out and now underneath it it would expose another reed of that paper, now you could go back and fix that mistake or write it again. This removed the top layer of the papyrus, excuse me, (coughs) and when the material dried, the second message (coughs) could be written, forgive me. (laughs) Now, in the context that we're talking about, the law that ruled from Moses to Christ, it was blotted out, the same term, By the redeeming work of the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you could imagine this piece of paper. And because of the blood of Jesus Christ. It erased. It blotted out the law. And now something else was written in its place. Now. It was rolled up and blowed away, and it can never be gathered together to rule against us. Again, the law. Now, it was literally done away with, and the place that the law was thus eradicated, the covenant of grace was now inscribed in God's new contract with man. Never again could the covenant be changed, because when you take papyrus, and that first layer was blotted out, you could not blot it out again, because it would cause the whole paper to fragment and be destroyed. And so you could only have one erasure on there and that's it. Otherwise you have nothing left. When Jesus took his blood, he blotted out the law and he put down his grace in its stead. It can never be changed. That's a term we find in the book of Colossians that goes back to archaeology and dealing the idea of papyrus paper. Isn't that kind of cool? Now, I think it's cool. You may say, well, I want to go back to sleep, but this is pretty cool to me. I love this ancient stuff. Now, you could blot out the first writing, but you could not blot out the second writing. It stood forever. Now, let's go to Ostraka. You say, what in the world is Ostraka? That sounds like a strange restaurant, Ostraka. Well, let's see what Ostraka is. Writing material had one great drawback for the poor people of that day. It cost lots of money. Now, today we're blessed. We have paper all the time. We make paper airplanes. We waste it. But back then, 
paper was very costly. How costly? 20 centuries ago, if a soldier in the army wanted a sheet of paper to write on, it would cost him one month's salary to get one sheet of paper. Most people could not afford paper. So what did the rest of the common people do? What did they, if they didn't have paper to write on, they couldn't even get papyrus to write on in the process, what would they do? Well, all the utensils of that day were made out of pottery. And when pottery broke, it was pretty much good for nothing. Until someone said, you know, let's recycle and reuse. What if we took the broken pottery and then take another piece of pottery and we begin to scratch in the surface of the pottery Bible verses, notes, things that we want to remember. Could you imagine a church service? I saw one person already going, Ur. can you imagine the preachers preaching and people going, Istraka. and trying to carve the notes into their pieces of pottery that they had with them? These broken pieces of pottery uh, with writing on them are called astraka. Astraka are the most valuable of all archaeological records for the student of the New Testament because we find the common records of daily living. Anything that was noteworthy was written on astraka. You talk about people saying, all right, I want you to remember we have a dinner appointment, so let me write this uh, dinner appointment. There you go. That way you don't forget your appointment. Hey, let's have a contract. Hey, let's uh, put a border here. I'll trade you one cow, uh, cow for a couple ducks. Here you go. Let's write it down. Here's a contract. Everything they did in that life, that's what the people would write, is they would write on these broken pieces of pottery called a straka. Now, when archaeologists got to a site and dug down through 12 or 20 layers of history, they would find these straka. And what they have found is thousands and thousands of poor people who had scribbled sermon notes or a Bible verse or a prayer from Jesus or a prayer from Paul or a prayer from David on a piece of pottery. <coughs> that was a straka and we found evidence of it. So let's come to a conclusion. You guys have listened patiently. What conclusions can we draw based off of these evidences that we have? Well... Archaeologists can examine all these pieces of pottery, these pieces of paper, wax tablets, scrolls, and parchments, and they could line them up and put them together. And as they line them together on these artifacts, they could do something like reconstruct the entire book of Romans. So they line up all the pottery, they line up all the things, and look, we have the entire book of Romans as we kind of read from piece to piece. They had to have something... All the Bibles were destroyed through persecution, which we'll cover later. But we have evidence that they had something they were copying from and writing about. Now, do we have a single copy of the entire book of Romans written in Greek language older than 420 AD? No. Do we have a manuscript copy of the entire book of Romans dating from the first century? Yes. You understand it's how you ask that question. The uh, scholars who deny the Bible said, listen, we do not have a single copy of the book of Romans together that dates earlier than 400. Okay. Do we have a copy of the book of Romans still? Yes, we could find it in archaeology. Does it make sense? It depends on who you're teaching, what you're trying to indoctrinate. If you're trying to teach them encouragement, we could say, look, we have all kinds of evidence. Or you could be the Bible professor and say, listen, we have no manuscript together. Therefore, the Bible is not complete. You understand, it's how you interpret it, how you look at it. We have plenty of evidence if you wanted to know about it. Now, if it ha just had to be pieced together from the existing manuscript record, we could look at all of these and say, they had a copy of Romans. Here's proof. Now, by the time the authorized version was translated into English in 1611, there were 25 existing manuscripts that were valuable to the translator. So, in 1611, we had 25 complete manuscripts of the, Old Test or of the New Testament. Does that make sense? Over the next 219 years, 11 more were discovered. Wonderful. And then... Over the next 10 years after that, archaeology just pulled, rolled up its sleeves, dug in, and found 6,430 more manuscripts that were brought to light. Now, the professors will say this. Since the King James Bible was translated in 1611, we have discovered 6,000 more manuscripts. And the way that they say that is to have the idea that we found more evidence that your Bible is not correct. However... 
All of the new discoveries didn't undermine the authority of the word of God, but actually proves that the Bible is correct. They don't give that tidbit. They try to make it sound like we found more evidence that you're wrong. No, they found more evidence that we're right. Every time they find stuff, it shows, hey, look, it's the same Bible that we have. And it verifies in every particular detail the authority and the accuracy and the inerrancy of the authorized version. Now, we talked about in the beginning that God warns people not to add or to take away from his word. So let's see something. Turn with me. If you're still in the book of Colossians, look with me, Colossians chapter 1. Now, God put a warning, right? Don't add or take away from his word. That is a clear warning. We have all kinds of evidence that the book of Colossians is written correctly. We have that through archaeology. We have it through these different records. We can prove that Colossians is there. Every verse is accounted for. Notice with me, if you don't mind, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 12. It says... Giving thanks unto the Father, which have, excuse me, which have made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. Verse 13, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Now that's pretty amazing that we have forgiveness of blood or forgiveness of sins. How do we have forgiveness of sins class? Through his blood. Well, remember, we have evidence that Colossians is correct in its entirety. But let's happen to look at a different version. Let's look at the revised standard version. It says, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Are they missing something? Yeah. They're missing this idea here through his blood. They've taken out this phrase through his blood. Now remember, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Well, that's a big change. And doesn't the Bible say not to add or take away anything from the Bible? And yet they have taken away through his blood. Well, someone will say, well, that's the revised standard version. That's the liberal Bible. Let's go to a conservative Bible. Remember, outside of the authorized version, the uh, NIV is considered the conservative Bible. Let's see what the conservative Bible of the NIV says. It says in Colossians 1.14 in the NIV, In whom we have redemption... The forgiveness of sins. Once again, they have taken out the phrase, through his blood. You know, God has given a pretty big warning not to add or to take away from his scripture. And when you take out a big proponent like this, that in his blood is how we have redemption of sins, that is taking away salvation. Because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Now, how did they justify this? How did they justify the change? Well, our oldest manuscripts, the way that we see things, we have no evidence that through his blood should be in this passage. Well, they have plenty of evidence. They just choose not to put that evidence in there. This is a big deal. As we understand and explaining about the Bible and the history of the Bible, we understand it has a more than an academic uh, consequence. It is dealing with a spiritual nature of can we trust the Bible because it is through the Bible we have the scriptures speak of eternal life. This salvation that is found through his blood. Thank you for listening to this audio message. This is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and I encourage you to take this information that you just received and make a specific decision to follow after the Lord. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, let me beg you to take the time to receive Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you are saved, I encourage you to make a decision in your life to help you get closer with the Lord. If there's anything specific we can do to be a blessing or to pray for you, we encourage you. Look us up on the internet at riverviewbc.com. Once again, that's riverviewbc.com. Or if you would prefer to call us, you can give us a call at area code 920 920- 
920-530-6308. Once again, that number is 920-530-6308. If there's anything we can do to be a blessing or an encouragement to you, please let us know. We would love to make ourselves available. Thank you.